Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new episode of Asia Progressive. Today, we're going to talk about the new escalations in Taiwan and what China might be thinking of doing in the coming days, months, or years. Uh, we've always heard about China being, uh, you know, trying to increase its hegemony in the region and in the world. But we have seen this escalation uh, really, you know, even with the new U.S. Uh, administration, it has been uh, put as a very uh, important strategic uh, point from now on. So this is our episode from today. So there is a famous saying in China, Mao made the country one, Deng made the country rich, and Xi made the country strong. Let's see from this episode what uh, Xi is intending to do in, in the near future for China. So Michael, what do you think about the new escalations that are going on in the South China Sea and specifically for about Taiwan? Well, you know, uh, thanks, Meg. Clearly, you know, the situation is getting more dangerous than it had been before. Uh, you know, as I think anybody familiar with the conflict knows, you know, the, the issue basically has its roots in the fact that that in, in many ways, uh, China is supposed to be one country uh, and uh, Taiwan and mainland China are included in this. And in fact, this was something that uh, previously uh, both governments agreed upon. So, uh, you, know, for, you know, when the civil war in China uh, ended more or less in 1949, uh, the, the, the communist party was left in control of the mainland and the, uh, the government of the, the Republic of China uh, was confined simply to uh, the island of Taiwan and a few other small islands near Taiwan. Uh, and they both basically had the idea that it was just sort of a, a lull in the civil war and that sooner or later, uh, you know, they, it, China would become one China again. Uh, the Taiwanese government at that time felt that they would re-land on the mainland and, and, and reconquer it from uh, the, the Communist Party and the Communist Party uh, saw it the other way around. Uh, so this sort of unusual legal situation uh, continues to many ways today. Uh, nowadays, you know, no one in Taiwan thinks that they're going to, uh, I think almost no one anyway, thinks they're going to land on the mainland and, uh, you know, uh, reabsorb uh, communist China. But uh, on the, the other way around, uh, you know, obviously China has become strong uh, in recent years, beginning with uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms which began in 1979. It's now the number two economy in the world. Uh, by purchasing power parity, it's already uh, richer than the United States. And uh, its GDP uh, is expected to surpass the United States' GDP by the end of this decade. So um, obviously uh, we know that the uh, Chinese government, uh, because they tell us uh, that uh, they still intend to reunite or remerge Taiwan into uh, one China in the future. But we also know that uh, Taiwan itself has had, in the meantime, uh, basically since the 1990s, uh, its own democratic revolution and, and reforms within the country. And it's now one of the most you know, open and progressive and, and, and interesting uh, democratic uh, areas uh, in Asia. So it's, uh, it's a dangerous situation. Uh, I think it's getting more dangerous, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's not one which is easy to resolve in my mind. So China has always been, it uh, has always had a target about China's, as you mentioned, reunification, or they, they also call it China's rejuvenation. Uh, so in their plan, it is not just about military, Military might and you know um, it's it's uh, it's philosophy of not necessarily using the might but always using the show of might to you know uh, in in enable its hegemony in the in the region. But um, you know when you look at the military part of uh, China, uh, even according to the U.S. Um, naval intelligence in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, James Fennell, he says that China already has a, a bigger might than the U.S. in terms of Navy, ship numbers, 
and it has almost five times more, uh, you know, in 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 the last five years in this uh, in this statistics. So, is this threat of military, in you know, uh, military action or uh, incursion into Taiwan a real uh, threat, or is it just you know show of might? Mm. Well, I think if we were talking you know, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, it was not really a realistic prospect. Uh, today, I think uh, it's becoming more and more a realistic prospect. And, and in fact, you know, one of the interesting things strategically from the Chinese point of view, the Beijing point of view, is the longer they wait, uh, the longer, the better their, their position becomes, I think, militarily and economically. You know, there's uh, moving too soon could be their big mistake in a sense. Um, so, uh, you know, as for whether or not the Chinese Navy or, or the, uh, their Air Force would be able to defeat uh, U.S. forces, uh, which are in, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, coming out of Yokosuka or Okinawa or Guam, uh, I really don't know. I mean, it's hard to predict these military things. I mean, even the, the, the top experts, you know, uh, may think they know what the military balance is. But then once they get into actual fighting, you know, everybody could be shocked. And, and, and you know, military history shows this time and time again. Uh, we know that the United States' military is very strong. We know that China's military is becoming strong. So, um, you know, the basic answer is yes. I think that the, 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 the potential threat is there. Uh, it, it could go either way, especially if more time goes by. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's not something that's guaranteed and probably both sides realize uh, that um, it would be better if they don't have to fight because it would be devastating. So um, in the event of, let's say, the actual fighting does happen either by um, provocation of the Taiwanese or from the U.S., uh, or China actually, you know, planning to do this. In the in the event of hap this happening, Ch Japan just announced in its um, defense papers, or no, Suga also announced that in the event of this happening, Japan will actually be involved in defending Taiwan. Um, is this just a threat, or is it something that Japan is really capable or willing to do? Right. Well. Uh, because you know, uh, we do have, uh, you know, we do have the nuclear threat, number one, and China does have nuclear powers. And number two, Ch you know, the Chinese um, missiles can easily reach Japan. They have the 300 kilometer uh, miles, uh, uh, kilometer missiles. And it is very easy because, you know, Japan does have also U.S. base. So it would, it would be a good, uh, you know, win-win situation for China to hit Japan in that scenario? Well, I mean, there's a few parts of that that, that I, you know, I would take apart. First of all, yes, uh, you know, the Japanese defense ministry people and, and sort of conservatives in the ruling party are very much thinking that, uh, you know, if there was a, a Chinese uh, conflict between China and Taiwan, that Japan would need to get involved for its own security. Uh, so this way of thinking is definitely there. Uh, is Japan uh, prepared for such a conflict? I'm absolutely sure that Japan is not prepared for such a conflict because no matter what, you know, uh, high technology jets they may have bought from the United States, the, the, the whole mentality and spirit of the Japanese people uh, would not, is not built for war at this time, time in, in their history. Um, you know, there would, uh, this isn't a society that's willing to lose a thousand people on the beaches of any country, uh, frankly. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Japan may have like the super high technology, but it's got this giant glass jaw, which can be shattered very easily. And, and I think that this is, you know, uh, very clear if anyone who, you know, spends time in Japanese society. Um, but, um, you know, as for the question of you know, what's actually the China's advantage, you, know, you don't wanna forget about all of the very important you know, 
economic and, and interdependent, you know, interdependency between all of these economies. I mean, the United States, China, Japan, Taiwan, they're all very, very tightly economically uh, interwoven. And so there's really no such thing as winning. It would just be a matter of who loses more badly. Because if the US economy was damaged, that would damage the Chinese economy. If the Chinese economy is damaged, that would, you know, that would also hurt everybody. So, uh, you know, it's not like uh, the old days of the 19th century or something where one country goes to war and the damage is mostly done to the losing country. Nowadays, everybody loses because of all of the economic interdependence. And you do mention the economics and especially the, the superconductors, the chips that we use in all of our, uh, you know, intelligent, uh, you know, material like iPhones, the computers, the cars, you know, we, and the, in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan has a company TSMC, which produces 56% of all this, the global uh, share of this chip. So um, even with the COVID-19, the lack of uh, source, you know, having this chip created a crisis in the world. So having a war is going to create a bigger crisis, I guess. Now, all the countries like Japan and the US after COVID-19, and they experienced the lack of it, when, what, could, what could happen to their economy with the lack of this superconductor chip. Uh, they've both um, given a huge fund to uh, invest in this superconductor. China also did that. And uh, so let's say Japan is now even going to increase their funding from 200 billion uh, to I think 108 or no 1.8 billion dollars they're going to invest in in this superconductor uh, industry the US is going to do the same so as you said it's not a going it's not going to be no one's going to win from this kind of war because if Taiwan is under war their their superconductor resource is going to be cut and even if Japan and the US did start this kind of industry this industry takes time to, to have as a, a viable out, you know, producing uh, company. And it's not about like five or 10 years, it, it takes time to, to achieve. But how about the timeline? There is a discussion about um, China's timeline if in, you know, it is going to invade or you know, retake, uh, whichever you want to is, use the term, Taiwan, uh, because you know, some people say that they might use its 100th uh, anniversary of the revolution to, to have by that time, whoever the leader is by that time, to, you, to be celebrating the reunification of China. Do you think this is an accurate kind of timeline? Because if that's going to happen, it's, everyone is saying that if, if, if China is going to take any action, it's going to be in, in this period, in this decade, from 2020, um, 20, 21, until 2030. But it, you know, the, the anniversary is in like uh, 2047. Yeah, I guess uh, you could say that the, uh, you know, the, the Civil War ended in, in, in uh, 1949. So I suppose yeah. the, the, the outward uh, date then would be 2049. So, you know, would China, if it's going to act, act within the next 25, 30 years? Well, yeah, I think that is pretty much the, the danger point. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Xi and anniversaries. As you, as you know, uh, we just passed the 100th anniversary of the uh, uh, founding of the Chinese Communist Party. And it was during that event when uh, she made some very striking comments uh, about uh, Taiwan. And let me just kind of uh, read the, the, uh, the, the point, uh, the kind of the salient point about Taiwan, what he had to say about it. He said, resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification is a historic mission and an unshakable commitment of the Communist Party of China. We must take resolute action to utterly defeat any attempt toward Taiwan independence and work together to create a bright future for nat national rejuvenation. No one should underestimate the resolve, the will, and the ability of the Chinese people 
to defend their national sovereignty and territorial integrity. So, you know, um, it's right there. I mean, he, he, this, it, you know, you don't have to read much into that. He, he says it quite openly there that uh, Taiwan's independence will not be tolerated, that it will be reabsorbed into the Chinese mainland. And, you know, no one should uh, underestimate uh, Beijing's will to do so. So, you know, if, uh, if what she is saying at this very important occasion uh, is, is the fact of Chinese policy, and it, there's no reason we shouldn't believe that it is, then this is a, a threatening statement to, to be sure. Um, but meanwhile, you have the US, even though they passed the new bill, Taiwan Invasion Prevent Prevention Act, uh, they gave it the AUMC authorization of use of force, of military force in the, uh, in the occasion, or if it happened that uh, China did um, invade or retake Taiwan. Uh, but they do have this ambiguous in diplomacy until now, and they, I think they would always want to, you know, uh, keep the status quo of this ambiguity. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it says, like, for example, U.S. will provide defense weapons and services as necessary, but it does not specify what the defenses are going to be. And then it says U.S. will maintain military capacity capability in the West Pacific to prevent um, uh, and, uh, coercion against Taiwan. But uh, it, you know, in this necessary, it, it might mean just the sales of weapons. So uh, to me, it looks, because even for um, Taiwan, even if China did have a military invasion or retake of Taiwan, um, I mean, the Taiwanese are not welcoming this, I guess, in, in the recent uh, uh, popular statistics. So how are you going to control uh, uh, a country that is not necessarily you know, welcoming? It's going to be a tough control region, I guess, to, you know, for China. Now, um, yeah. Well, just to agree so with the, that point briefly. Yeah, I mean, if this happens, it would be a a, a horrific tragedy of, of a global scale, no doubt. So uh, if, if there is going to be a certain timeline where China, oh, sorry, where the US is also ready for this kind of uh, clash with China and China's ready and Japan is ready. For example, Japan aims for uh, having 40% of uh, semiconductors by, by 2030. So uh, of a gl global share. And the US is also preparing you know, its Navy. Um, I'm sure you know, even in the soft powers you know, using you know, social media, they're going to entice the Ch Taiwanese to be more uh, against any kind of Chinese uh, invasion. But it's, it's all about also the control of the South China Sea, as I see it also, because it is uh, an important uh, route for, for ships and uh, for, for the economy of the world, I guess. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've always so, had a I mean, different view about that. I mean, uh, although the United States uh, is always talking about the threat to the South China Sea, you know, um, I'm like, I, I, I I always kind of uh, wonder uh, if um, if th this isn't kind of blown out of proportion, because uh, you know why would uh, China uh, want to cut off uh, trade through the South China Sea? Because this is a global lifeline. I, again, this is something where the China's um, you know own economy is deeply connected to the global economy. So you know anything they do to uh, you know, the rest of the world they're doing to themselves. But uh, at the same time, um, you know, they're definitely this, this, my point of view is not the one that is shared uh, in Washington. And, uh, uh, you know, we have a little bit of footage here, which I'd like to introduce to our, our, our uh, listeners, which is from uh, Kurt Campbell. Uh, he is basically the person who's in charge of uh, Asia policy for the, for the Biden administration. Uh, and uh, I have two short clips uh, I want to run by him. Uh, here's the first one. I will tell you, I was out of government for 10 years. 
Um, coming back in, I was astonished by some of the things I, I, I read and saw and experienced and, and have had uh, diplomatic engagements about. And one of them is just undeniable, a very assertive, determined China that, that wants to play the leading role on the global stage and has really quite unsentimental views of the United States and really, I think, wants to reshape the operating and system, the operating system of Asia, this complex mix of freedom of navigation and peaceful resolution of disputes and sort of the forward deployment allied uh, uh, partnership with, with a different system, with components of the previous system, but things that will clearly favor uh, 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 China. You're going to see this shift for the first time really in our history, the Indo-Pacific, Asia will be the center of our regional focus. And you'll see this movement from the Middle East um, and it will be painful in all likelihood. We'll see some real challenges in places like Afghanistan, but a much greater focus on the Indo-Pacific. You can see that process underway in the Pentagon, rethinking long range strike, rethinking how our, we're positioned in the Indo-Pacific. A lot of innovative um, uh, skill uh, being uh, brought to the, uh, the to the case. So there we have uh, Kurt Campbell, and you know basically what he's talking about in that that first of two clips I'm going to show you is what in the Obama administration was called uh, the uh, the pivot to the Pacific. And so essentially what he is suggesting there is that you know uh, while the U.S. military has been deeply involved in uh, what Americans call the Middle East uh, or West Asia uh, for a very long time. Uh, he says that the center basically of US military action is now going to slow down in, in the Middle East and move to East Asia uh, in order to confront uh, China, which uh, you know the US uh, Pentagon and military planners um, see as the, the main threat to the United States uh, in the coming decades, uh, starting from now, basically. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, we heard already, you know, uh, President uh, Xi's uh, sort of threats over Taiwan. Uh, so in this uh, segment here, I want to show you basically that the threats aren't just going in one direction. Uh, this is Kurt Campbell of the Biden administration uh, essentially sending a threat back. Do I believe that the next little while um, in terms of the relationship between the United States and China will be different than this previous period that we broadly describe as engagement? I do. Um, I believe that the defining characteristics of the period ahead will be um, around competition. I will say, I think this time is going to be much more difficult. Um, I, I, I worry sometimes that the Chinese leadership um, I, I, one hopes to find ourselves in a situation that a degree of, of, of coexistence, of uh, recognition that the Indo-Pacific in the world is big enough for two great powers. Um, I, some of what we've seen from uh, President Xi and his colleagues suggests that China's ambitions um, surpass that. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are things that, uh, but those can't really be handled through persuasion. I think they have to be dealt with through performance. And so that's why I say the most important elements associated with our strategy and for anyone, any American president is to ensure that we've taken the right steps on technology, on education, on mustering an effective um, coalition of allies. Uh, do I think it's possible that the United States and China can coexist and leave, live in peace? Yes, I do. But I do think the challenge is going to be enormously difficult for this generation and the next. One of the reasons why the international community in the United States is so clear about our dissatisfaction by what China has undertaken in uh, Hong Kong is a clear sense that quietly behind the scenes, um, Chinese interlocutors have studied and tried to make an assessment. If we can do this, what's the international response? And what does that tell us about what the re response would be with respect uh, to Taiwan? I just want to underscore that such an effort would be, would be catastrophic. So, uh, so we have the, the US uh, Asia policy chief essentially saying that if China moves against Taiwan, uh, it will be catastrophic. 
Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's very clear. Uh, although, you know, Kurt Campbell himself, unfortunately, doesn't speak English very well. He speaks this kind of bureaucratic American uh, lingo that, that, that's not very clear, very indirect. But, uh, but still, uh, if you uh, know the, the, the terminology and, and sort of the jargon he uses, it, his meaning is very clear. What did you think of that? Interesting. Well, um, I do feel that the Americans are now trying to focus a little, shift a little bit of the focus from the Middle East to um, to Asia, to South, you know, to the South Asia Sea, South China Sea area, because um, you know we had recently just uh, the uh, the uh, American withdrawal from um, Afghanistan, and then you have the withdrawal from Iraq. And a lot of the media in this region is saying that probably this withdrawal is to reinforce the, the American Navy and, uh, you know, uh, the military might in the South China Sea. So it, it is also something that uh, even in this part of the world uh, is speculated to be the reason for the withdrawal for, of the American forces. Even though this is a, a, a interesting because if you just look at the Iran-US tensions, you would think that the US would want to maintain its uh, powers and uh, existence in the, in the region. Of course, they're not going completely away from the region, but they're reducing their forces from the region. So I think in, in, an, in, a, in an indirect way, we could see that somehow they see that they will settle the, the conflict with Iran in some way, or at least freeze the conflict with Iran in some way, unlike what Israel would want uh, the Americans to be in the region, because it's always been the Israelis that wanted the American existence to be very heavy to protect their uh, interests, the Israeli interests, of course, and the American interests, of course. But now it seems to me that um, the ultra right wing uh, prime minister of Israel is not going to be uh, on the same page with the American foreign, you know, foreign diplomacy or foreign strategies in, in the region. So I do agree that this could be what the Americans are foreseeing in the near future as a strategy. Yeah, what I think. And I is... think there is. Go ahead. And, and going back to your point of the Americans, uh, you know, seeing the Chinese as trying to, you know, invade all of the South China Sea. Um, to me, I th of course, they spin it that way because they always have an audience, the American audience and the international audience to, to you know, uh, to present with all their, uh, you know, reasonings for any kind of aggressive uh, attacks or aggressive behavior. But as you said, I mean, like China, I think if you look at, at this the other way around, Regardless of if, if you agree with China's claims of the whole uh, South China or 80% of eight, uh, South China Sea, regard, we, yes, this is uh, problematic for all the, the, the countries in the region. But uh, if you look at it in a slightly different way, it could be that China is on the contrary worried that it is going to be isolated in that region i.e. that narrow, you know, uh, shipway, which is only three, three kilometers wide at some point, is surrounded by countries that are all allied to the U.S. And then further on ahead in the north, you have Taiwan, which is completely armed to the teeth with American weaponry. So, and, you know, China could be isolated from the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean if these countries, you know, come together and try to you know, kind of control China you know, it, it, on the coastal side. So it could be spun the other way, which is China is worried from being completely isolated from this very strategic uh, global seaway. So, you know, it, it, it could be taken both ways. Yeah, well, certainly the Chinese, uh, from the point of view, if you're a military planner from, for the Chinese government, you know, you're thinking about trying to keep the U.S. military as far away from your you know, your coastline as possible. But, you know, moving back a little bit to the pivot to the Pacific, you know, one thing which has occurred to me is that, you know, in 
the, the focus of, of the US military and the Pentagon, uh, you know, let's say, let's call it the US empire, uh, you know, since about 1956, the Suez War, you know, the US has been very much focused on the Middle East or what we call the Middle East, even though I don't particularly care for that, that, that name. And, you know, now we're hearing from, from Kurt Campbell uh, that, that the focus of US military action will move from the Middle East to uh, East Asia, Taiwan and the, and the, the uh, South China Sea. And I must say, it's not a prospect that, that, uh, that, that makes me feel good because, you know, well, let's look at the US record in the Middle East. You know, they've done a really great job there, haven't they? I mean, you know, the Middle East is doing really well after all of this attention from Pentagon planners. Uh, now, do we want oh, yeah. to bring that to, to uh, the South China Sea? Uh, I, I'm not looking forward to that prospect. Um, the problem is, you know, individual countries, when they think of their own uh, defenses and their own, uh, you know, independent, uh, you, know, um, uh, in, you know, economic or strategic uh, interests, they would think that, you know, having U.S. on their, on their back is better than having them, uh, you know, uh, as a, an enemy. For example, that's what I'm talking about when I say the allies of the U.S. in the South China Sea. But what they, for example, from for our part of the world, we know that you know having that kind of alliance has a lot of strings attached. If it's not in the, in the form of wars, it's in the form of control and political control. Lebanon is experiencing it, the, you know, firsthand. Um, so yeah, this is this is an issue. Of, I mean, like it's a problem because you don't want the U.S. as an enemy, but at the same time, you don't want to be completely under U.S. control, especially when you have this kind of uh, a start of a multi-polar conflict in the world, you know. And uh, obviously, China is planning a lot further ahead. It's a very communist way of planning. You know, you don't plan for a year ahead. You plan for 10, 5, 10, 15 years ahead. And they are really going forward with their plans economically, especially and strategically. And you have the big example of what they, what they call the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which is you know, taking over or investing in most coastal areas and inland uh, railways in the forms of investment or in the forms of just you know, funding or... Uh, and so you find that the Chinese are actually really planning ahead in this. And, and the G7 recently just caught up and they're trying to think of something that's a similar way of funding these, you know, uh, you know uh, important economic uh, routes for the, the global economy. And as we mentioned a little earlier, the global economy is now, unfortunately, in a very capitalistic way, is you know rely you know not self-sufficient it's always like taiwan is rely the globe is relying on taiwan for this uh, semiconductor production another country is only responsible for the building of the the material another country is only responsible for another part of the material so it is a very capitalistic way of quote unquote efficiency in you know in 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 production but this does not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, benefit each country because they don't have enough uh, substances to have a serving production for their own internal economy. But, you know, we might be too late in recognizing this when, you know, America is more and more deeply involved uh, in the South China Sea and Southeast, South, Southeast Asia region. Yeah, you said one thing there. Uh, that's very, very important. I mean, essentially, since 1945, in 1945, at the end of World War II, 50% of all industry, industrial production in the world was the United States. It stood, you know, far, far above any other country in the world at the end of the war. And, you know, we have had this sort of, you know, more or less unipolar dominance, even despite the, the Cold War, uh, from 1945, basically, up until the 2020s. This is the decade where that, uh, you know, US power being far above every other country is, looks like it's coming to an end. Uh, by the end of this decade, 
uh, the Chinese economy is expected to be larger than the US economy. And this is a new world. Obviously, uh, Kurt Campbell you know, recognizes that in his, uh, in, you know, in his statements that we just heard. Uh, but this is obviously also something that the US Republican Party also understands. Uh, and of course, they look at it more through kind of their own uh, sort of ideological Christian crusading point of, you know, point of view. And I kind of wanted to show a very brief clip uh, from a, a former Vice President Mike Pence, who just spoke about China recently. And we can kind of get the idea here that uh, this is sort of a bipartisan thing about confronting China, even if the tone is a little bit different. And Mike Pence, even though I very much disagree with what he says, uh, he's also much clearer and more direct in his uh, language uh, than, mm -hmm. than, than Kurt Campbell is. So let's, let's run the uh, Mike Pence clip here. There's an old saying that weakness arouses evil. And my sense is that China senses weakness in this new administration. The American people recognize today what our administration brought to the fore. The Chinese Communist Party is the greatest threat to our prosperity, security, and values on the face of the earth. China may not yet be an evil empire, but it's working hard every day to become one. Okay, so we're, there we have it. Uh, he's basically saying that China you know, is trying hard to become the new evil empire. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing already the sort of linguistic resources of the new Cold War already out there uh, on the table, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so even though we're, we're not shooting guns at each other yet, there's no U.S. China, you know, fight at the moment, you know, linguistically, rhetorically, ideologically, all those tools are already on the table. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, this is how they start a Cold War. I mean, you know, you always uh, arm yourselves, uh, yourself with the, the vocabulary first. It, you create the understanding to your audience that we are at a war with this certain side or that other certain side. It's the same as what we always see in the movies in Hollywood movies. It's always Hollywood movies that indicate uh, which side the Americans consider to be the enemy at that time of the film. So I guess we're going to see more of that, uh, you know, in the soft, you know, power, uh, you know, exerting soft power in the towards this Cold War with China. And we're both hoping, I guess, that uh, this actual war won't really happen. So as we can see that, you know, we're going ahead with a new decade of possibly Chinese hegemony being more and more obvious. And uh, the Cold War is now, we're into this Cold War uh, spin of both sides. And we're probably going to see a lot of more, a lot more of the competition in the economic side, for example, the technological side, the creation of uh, uh, the intelligence, artificial intelligence, the the quantum computing, the um, all kinds of, uh, of course, semicon semiconductors. And don't, don't, uh, this, don't, forget, don't forget 5G. 5G and 6G I yes, think is also an important course. part of it. 5G, exactly. So we're going to have a lot of competition moving ahead in this Cold War, hoping it stays a Cold War because, you know, as you might remember, sometimes Cold War benefits the small countries because both sides try to buy off the, their, their allegiance. So sometimes Cold Wars benefit, you know, weak, small countries. So as long as this does not move into an actual, uh, you know, military war, I think uh, we will see a competition that might be somewhat uh, in the technology or, you know, in the funding part. It might be um, moving ahead for all other countries of the world, but we just want, don't want any kind of real military action on both sides. I hope that you found that the second uh, episode of ours on Taiwan and the conflict in the South China Sea informative, and we hope to see you next week again.